If you think of mind as a thing, then you think, oh, I can take this thing and put it somewhere else. But it's not. It's more like breathing, which is what your lungs do. But in between the functionality and the reality is thought. And are we not talking about capturing that on a silicon chip? Uh, well, the, uh, according to the embodiment view, it's really important that there is a body connected to that chip or that brain for it to be conscious. While I'm more of a functionalist, I'm kind of happy if it's a virtual body existing only in uh, the software. And this is, of course, a big question. Where, where is thought here? Well, that is linking the mind to whatever actions the virtual or physical or biological bodies do. I guess my question is, do we even have the technology for that intermediary stage of thought? And um, Roman, I'm going to bring you in because from the perspective of cybersecurity, we have an incentive there. Um, is, does the technology exist for that intermediary stage? I'm not sure how you brought cybersecurity into that. I know, neither am I. So <laughs> then we talk about intelligence is a completely different set of issues versus consciousness, internal states, and qualia. When we talk about computers thinking or doing something equivalent, computing answers to solutions, problems, we know they do that. They do that better than I do in many domains. So the intelligence aspect of it, we are getting it, we are understanding it. Problem with consciousness is, as Anders correctly said, we don't know how to test for it. So some people claim that modern large language model are already conscious. Some large language models claim that they are conscious. <laughs> How would I test it? If I apply the same test as I do with everyone else, I kind of assume that you look like me, you talk like me, so you must be similar to me, you're not an NPC in a simulation. Then I have to give them that credit for possibly being conscious. It is also a safer option. If I deny them that possibility and they are conscious, we're going to do all sorts of horrible things to them. But if they're not conscious and I assume they are, it's only a small mistake to make. So this is a state of the art. At the same time, we have some philosophers who argue that people are not conscious. It's an illusion. And there is nothing conscious about you. You are a computation which, for some reasons, runs internal simulations and it helps you in your decision making. But the state of the art in the hard problem is that it's anywhere from the problem doesn't exist to everything's conscious. Right. The problem, the problem doesn't exist. Uh, I, don't, I really don't think so. The, hard prob the, the, the notion of this hard problem uh, comes from people like David Chalmers who argue that the normal problems that neuroscientists have to deal with are not hard enough. Uh, they're you pretty know, they're, hard. They're, yeah, yeah, I think they're pretty hard, they're right? Pretty hard. And in fact, I think those are the only hard problems. The, figuring out the biological basis of consciousness, the neurobiological basis of consciousness, that is the hard problem. Uh, to imagine that somehow there is an additional problem on top of which, which is how is it a physical stuff can create first person experience, is a pseudo problem. It's not a problem. Once you figure out, and we haven't, and we're not even close, but once we figure out, if we figure out how the brain produces things like first-person experiences, that's it, that you're, you're done. There's nothing else on top of that to be done. Uh, stuff on top of that becomes magic. I also would like to push back a little bit on this notion. We've been talking as if consciousness or mind were a thing. But they're not a thing, they're a process. Okay? Um, so and I think it's better to think of mind as minding. That's what the brain does when it's incorporated in, into a body that has ability to uh, have sensations, uh, perceptions, and things like that. So mind as a thing, is, it's a misleading notion. Because then you start, if you think of mind as a thing, then you think, oh, I can take this thing and put it somewhere else. But it's not. It's more like breathing, which is what your lungs do right, when they work properly. Nobody would think of taking breathing and moving it into a, into a computer as, you know, without the lungs accompanying it. And so I think that there, a lot of the, the problems here are, as a philosopher would say, semantics. Uh, if we don't agree on what we mean by these things, then we're going to run into circles. I just want to follow up on the, on the scientific aspect of it, um, because people like to think that, oh, we don't know anything about how consciousness works in the brain. That's not true. We know That's quite right. a lot. That's right. Like, there's been decades and decades of research of neuros cognitive neuroscientists doing careful experiments where, for example, you show the same picture to people. Sometimes they consciously see it. Sometimes they consciously don't see it. And you just can compare the brain activity. And sure, we don't have any kind of mechanistic explanation yet, but we're gathering data. We're getting coherent pictures. We're learning. 
And I agree with Massimo, like, eventually, hopefully, that will, will solve it. Like, so why are we doing this research? Why are we doing research? Yeah, because what, it's no, very that interesting. It's uh, apart fascinating. From the, <laughs> apart from the fact that it is fascinating, you know, what's, what's the end goal of being able to, let's just say we could upload our consciousness to the cloud. Like, what, what's the benefit of that? I don't think most neuroscientists do it because we want to upload. It's not why I um, do it. Right? So, so consciousness is essentially what defines us as human beings. The ability, by the way, this other, that's another interesting thing to, to discuss. Very often you hear something along the lines of, oh, we don't know what consciousness is. Yes, we do. It's the ability to have first-person experiences. Now, uh, of course, that can manifest itself in a number of ways. There's lots of nuance there, but that's what, it, what we're talking about. It's not a mystery. Um, why are we interested in consciousness? Because it's what defines us. It's, it's the most human thing you can think of. It can go wrong in a lot of ways, as any neuroscientist would tell you. So understanding how it works, what kind of brain mechanisms do or do not work and lead or do not lead to conscious experiences is fundamental because um, we want to be able, for instance, to fix it if, 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 uh, if something goes wrong, right? I think one of the most striking examples is, is the case of locked-in patients, yeah. where, where patients, because of brain lesions or, or uh, other kinds of lesions, they, they lose the ability to, to interact with the world. They can't move anymore. They can't talk. They can't open or close their eyes. And then it would be really cool to know if they are conscious in there, right? That seems really important. And actually, consciousness research has developed a way to test whether these people are conscious. And that's just been standard cognitive neuroscience. And that's very important to know. So the, the idea that it's tech marketing nonsense, is that? Nope. Uh, I think uh, there is a mistake here. <laughs> nope. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you think it's nonsense, but there are certainly people trying to achieve it and think this is doable. And uh, maybe they're wrong. But they're actually doing it. It's not marketing. What exactly they're, they're, are they doing? The reason people are interested, first of all, in computational neuroscience, if you could actually construct a brain emulation of an organism, you would demonstrate that you would actually have, let's disregard consciousness for a moment, that you have understood the low level functions well enough to model them and see what emerges from that. And that's going to teach you quite a lot of neuroscience. It might be that the pursuit of this is going to be really long and it's going to take a century or more. But that's going to teach us a lot about neuroscience. There is also really interesting medical reasons we want to be able to scan tissues very carefully and simulate them to figure out stuff. And if you could get an uh, emulated uh, lab animal, many people say this is the ethical way of testing many things. If we know this behaves like real animals, in that case we can maybe use them ethically while it would be not be ethical to use a lot of mice. Of course, then there are people like me who are a bit functional say, actually that lab, virtual lab mouse, might, you might have to treat it as well as the real lab mouse. And then there are, of course, us transhumanists who think that, well, we might get a shot at post-humanity if we can actually get this to work. But there's a lot of work getting there. So it's worth noting that there are many reasons, including AI safety, which is one of the most recent reasons. Because if you could get digitally readable human uh, brains, that might actually give us a, a better chance of getting values out of them in order to figure out how to align AI, which might be a safety and practical problem, regardless of whether the brains are conscious or not. So in terms of cyber security and um, marketing... She wants to come back to that. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm still looking for a connection. <laughs> I mean, uh, why are we doing this research ultimately? And, and is it even... Why are we doing research on consciousness? Uh, yes. We don't want to die. We want to be immortal. At least many of us do. It's the most important problem for which we spend zero of our public budget. Anything which might remotely help us solve the problem of immortality, we should try and do what we can. It's worth it, even if there is one in a million chance it's actually going to work for us. People so, so it's not being developed as a method of control? control. Uh, some people suggested creating uploaded AI safety researchers and having many of them run at very high clock speeds to quickly solve the problem. I, I think the problem, once you become a digital, a up, digital <laughs> upload in the cloud and Google, you no longer remain as a human. You don't want to eat, you don't want to drink, you don't have all the human needs, you may or may not have virtual body. So you essentially kind of have this pyrrhic victory where you are immortal, but you killed humanity. You became something else which has very little to do with us. Those systems are smarter, they run on higher 
clock speeds, we have infinite memories, so it's not the win-win we, we would hope to get out of it. Uh, I don't care if superintelligence which is killing me is natural or an upload uh, or evolved. It doesn't matter. It's the same outcome. It's a malevolent piece of software. Uh, the cybersecurity link here actually goes more to my view that I think it might actually be a good form of existence to exist as a software person. But that means that you suddenly care about your cybersecurity a lot more. <laughs> be be because you don't want somebody to hack you. You don't wa uh, want somebody to steal your backup and run uh, an enslaved version of you for entertainment. You suddenly care a lot about the computer you're running on. And uh, the cybersecurity research better solve the problem of have to make a safe computer for me. And any anyone's going to enslave my copies, it's me. <laughs> right. Why, why do I get this nagging impression that somebody's been reading too much science fiction uh, recently? So, so, um, so, so what kind of pro progress, for instance, has been made? Because, you know, I've had these discussions actually here for the last 10 or 15 years. And every time that I come, uh, that somebody tells me, well, it's going to happen in about 30 years. So 15 years later, you would think it's going to happen in 15 years. No, it's still 30. Um, <laughs> what, what, what exa can you give me an example of a progress in the direction of mind uploading? Uh, the fruit fly, uh, connectome, and functionalization of that. That's biology. That's not that's not uploading consciousness. Yep, uh, and I agree. It's simulating, uh, again. Not, yeah. But no. I think that is progress, because uh -huh. you actually need enough of a brain to start doing the cognitive science on it. Right now, we can't do the cognitive science we can norm do on normal fruit flies. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm going to bring a dinner in. Well, yeah. can I challenge you a little bit? Because you said everybody wants to be immortal, and that's the thing we're all striving for. But I, I don't want to be immortal. Right. Like, I don't, I don't think that's necessarily a good thing to want for humanity. Well. I think it's a bad thing. It fact. depends, it depends on thing. how you present this question. So if mm. right now your normal lifespan is expected to be, let's say, 80 years old, that sounds pretty good. you may not want to live 500. But if your norm was reduced, if I said everyone is actually at 40, you would fight really hard to be 80. And it's the same in any other. When we do those experiments, basically people who are supposed to live 500 really disappointed that they only get 200. But I guess you have this built-in bias for normalcy. And then I ask, well, why do you want to stop leaving? People usually say, it's going to be so boring. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You can attend any panel. You can read every book, have sex with everyone. Like, what are you talking about? Here, here's Priority. what you're talking about. Book, um, sex, friends. You can, uh, if you're talking about actual immortality, I think that human psychology is simply not prepared for even grasping okay. what, human, what immort true immortality is. So if you ask us, uh, would you like to live five years or beyond the 80, we'll probably say yes, so assuming that we're in good health, right? 100, 120, whatever. You can push a little bit. But forever, it's not 100 or 500, or it's forever. You can always cancel. You can always... Uh, <laughs> it's not an infinite membership. You don't sure. get your goal. But you said you could have all the panels, all the sex, all the cappuccinos that you want. But if you actually do that for a literally infinite number of times, because that's what it would come down to, you will commit suicide at some point. I'm not against you committing You're not committing against okay. suicide. So Good. Everybody Why don't now, are you against, uh, so what about the fact that it is death itself that allows you, for instance, to be alive right now? If people didn't die before, nobody here would be alive. People who achieve immortality have fewer kids, historically. Uh, it doesn't matter. If you have one, even one kid, you're going to be overwhelming the... the, the it's the a large universe no, and a big simulation. Yep. Can I just... Can uh, I just can let's I just, just point out another... Sorry, you one, have just one more, one more comment. Sanity. That is why, that's why I think of this whole thing as essentially religion for uh, nerds. <laughs> well, what we're talking about is... Hallelujah. Yep. Yeah, if we were in a church and this was a discussion among fundamentalists and, you know, the invoking God to live forever, this is precisely the kind of things we would What get. would happen at that church with your argument, though? You would argue that people would commit suicide in heaven. People are going to be so bored by that song and the glory of God. So they are going to kill themselves. Going to Absolutely. That they, don't know, they don't know. Have you ever read Dante's uh, comedy, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, and now, if you get to... Oxford, which is really weird. When you get to heaven in Dante's comedy, that's where the really boring part is. It's like, oh, come on. Uh, hell is way more exciting than Dante. Absolutely. Uh, but but I, I strongly company. disagree with you. I do think actually we change what our interests are. Yes, after a while, the cappuccinos and sex might become boring, but you might find other interests. Uh, I don't I, know. I actually don't know how we got to this point. In the <laughs> 
In a um, sufficiently long conversation, immortality and religion always comes up here. Right. Can we, can we just back up slightly? Because uh, on the subject of biology and on the subject of consciousness, how could we live forever by uploading our consciousness to the cloud when biologically our body... To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. With a free trial, you can enjoy the full talk and thousands more. Thank you for being part of the conversation.